The title is Imagery and Interpretation in International Medicine. We're actually going to start with discussion of Seattle and our own international world here. Dr. Kerry Jackson is the first speaker, and Kerry is an associate professor in general internal medicine. He actually works at Harborview, where Hugh and I work, and he is director of the international clinic where none of the patients speak English, and he'll be telling you about this clinic. He also has developed an amazing program that's called Community House Calls Program, and he leads our interpreter services, and he'll be discussing these during his presentation. He received his medical degree from Michigan, and he also has an MA in anthropology, as well as a master's in public health. And I think you'll realize that this additional training is important because it helps guide his understanding of the many different cultures. He did his residency at UC Irvine and also a preventive medicine residency <coughs> fellowship here at the University of Washington. His work addresses the challenges of providing health care to the Seattle community. And there are two issues that he really has been working on. One is how to overcome language barriers when you're trying to be a provider and, care, and providing care for these patients. The second area that he has worked on has to do with recognizing cultural expressions of illness. And it's an intriguing topic that he will cover. Um, he has really established a remarkable record of scholarship and community service, and he's greatly appreciated for, from many within our own community. He's received numerous awards. Uh, one of them, most recently, was a very prestigious University of Washington Sterling Monroe Public Service Teaching Award. Um, I'm very happy. that Kerry's one of my heroes. He's, he leads our efforts at Harborview to take care of people from around the world. And so... Kerry is the true pro, I'm just an amateur, but there are days in my surgery clinic at Harborview for where nearly one half of the patients don't speak English. So we work with interpreters extensively. We teach our students in the medical school how to work with interpreters, and I think it's, it's very fun. I, why travel or why go to the United Nations when I can just show up for clinic in the morning? <laughs> We teach our residents at Harborview the word for pain, and I think I've collected over now 27 different languages uh, where we know the word for pain. As surgeons, all we have to do is look at the patient, recite that word, whether it's tong, dao, jip, moon, whatever it might be in whatever language from around the world, say it with inflection and then just ask them to point. <laughs> so we're very pleased to have Kerry. He's, he's my hero. He's a leader of the effort to take care of the immigrant community in Seattle, as well as a good friend and my neighbor. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Kerry Jackson lead off tonight. Great. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you very much. That was very kind. Um, most of my work is done, as, as mentioned, at Harborview, and I'm often in this situation as a doc confronting a patient, the one seated here, uh, th with the help of an interpreter. And so when we think about interpretation in medicine, which I'm going to talk with you about, we often think about it in this context, but it goes beyond this, um, beyond the actual interpretation of words to the interpretation of the meaning of symptoms, the interpretation of illnesses and their meaning in certain contexts that people live in, as well as um, the interpretation of systems, and uh, I have developed an interest in, in systems, and systems is a kind of technology, like it or not, we're much more interested in, in, in electronic gizmos, but the fact is that, that in the early uh, part of this century, systems like insurance and um, uh, formularies and administrative systems are part of the technologies of health that we have to make patients familiar with and that are part of our own um, headaches. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. But let me back up and remind you that immigration in this country looks like, these, uh, looks like this these days. If you look at the foreign-born residents in the United States, it, uh, it counts for about 12 percent of the uh, population according to the 2005 census. Or, um, and that's about the same in Washington State, but it's about 19 percent in King County and in Seattle proper, where it represents about 100,000 people. Looking across the country, you can see that most of the immigrants and refugees reside in California, no surprise, followed by Texas and Florida and New York. 
Um, but then Georgia, North Carolina, Illinois, and Washington have substantial populations. Now, before the current wave uh, in the last 25 years of immigration, the previous one was in the 30 years between 1892 and 1922. And this was the face of immigration, and it came through Angel Island and Ellis Island. <clears throat> if you look on the left, it's um, statistics from the turn of the century that are national. And you can see most of the immigrants were coming from Europe, Germany, followed by Ireland, Europeans coming through Canada, Great, uh, Great Britain, and Scandinavians, as well as those from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. And it looks similar in Washington, most of them European. Uh, but a substantial percentage, largely Chinese, coming uh, from uh, Asia, about 9%. Now, in 2005, it's a completely different picture. Uh, most of the immigrants to the nation coming from Mexico, followed by the Philippines and India, China, Vietnam. But in our region, still about 19% come from Europe. The larger, largest portion, nearly 40%, come from Asia. And uh, a substantial 5% come from Africa, and that's growing, as well as the 26% that come from Mexico and the other countries you can see there. The current wave in our area from Asia started following the Southeast Asian wars in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, as you know. And this is exemplified by this um, Cambodian family forced out of Cambodia. And often, they relocated to traditional Chinatowns. This is true uh, Southeast Asian refugees because there were services established and stores and, um, and neighborhoods that they felt comfortable in. So in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, um, Los Angeles, that was the pattern. In, uh, they were also forced into public housing as these Cambodian kids in Philadelphia um, de depict. In Seattle, this looks like most of their immigrants resettled in the 80s and 90s in the Central District, International District, the Rainier Valley, and made use of the, the healthcare facilities in those neighborhoods that had traditionally taken care of the underserved. The Sisters of Providence, the Old Pacific Medical Center, Harborview, and many of the community clinics such as uh, Country Doctor or um, Odessa Brown and the International District Clinic. But then families, as the communities matured and families established themselves, the, the immigrant uh, first generation began to learn English, got jobs at Boeing and, uh, and other industry, had kids. They wanted to move to more affordable housing where they could purchase a home and, uh, and then bring people over, uh, extended family that had been uh, trapped back home in camps or in um, unsettled or unstable um, situations at home as this East African family shows. And so family sponsorship of immigrants represents about 650,000 immigrants nationally. So these families tend to move in our area north to Linwood and Shoreline or south to, to uh, Tequila, Kent, Auburn, elsewhere, where houses are more affordable and away from the traditional safety net providers that saw them historically, but now confronting Northwest Hospital, Stevens, or Highline, Valley, Overlake, with a mix of, of uh, patients that they're not accustomed to seeing. And this isn't unique to Seattle. The same story can be told of any major metropolitan area, and you saw the immigrant populations living in Georgia, living in uh, largest population of Marshallese is in Little Rock, Arkansas. So it's, a, it's the same story across the country. And these populations come with a burden of illness that's a, a different mix. Uh, here's just a handful of them, hepatitis B uh, and certain cancers, hepatoma, cervical cancer, gastric cancers, prostate cancer, other comorbid conditions such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, tuberculosis, and so you've got a complex community addressing uh, health facilities with an unusual mix of illnesses that, that physicians are not accustomed to seeing in great number. And then they interact with the healthcare system and get treated slightly differently, which has been well documented in this recent publication or in the last few years of the Institute of Medicine entitled Unequal Treatment, which documents uh, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare in this country. If you were to look at, at King County rates of disease by ethnicity, you can see the disparities. Uh, this is just an example of a few of the ones that I mentioned. This is liver disease, which includes here cirrhosis, uh, cancers, and, and uh, uh, alcoholic liver disease and hepatitis. Uh, documented in 1993 to 2003, and you can see the rates among um, American Indians are nearly triple those of their African American and white counterparts. 
Now, if you're able, what you can't get here is that Africans are lumped in with African Americans and Asians are lumped, Asian immigrants, Southeast Asians are lumped in with Chinese and Japanese counterparts that have been here for generations. So it distorts that. If you could tease out Southeast Asian rates or African rates, you'd see that for liver disease, they're much more comparable to their um, American, uh, Native American counterparts. And the reason is because of the endemicity of hepatitis B globally. Nearly 45% of the globe is, uh, has endemic hepatitis B, or, and those countries in dark green here have greater than 8% endemicity. So that's true in Amazonas, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and as you can see in, uh, among Alaskan natives and uh, Inuit in northern Canada. And hepatitis B is responsible for the far and away most of the cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer globally. Turning to a different disease completely, this is diabetes. And you can see in the lavender what the rates are in the nation, and the dark purple what the rates are uh, here in King County. And you can see that, again, African Americans have nearly triple the rates of diabetes that their white counterparts do, as do Native Americans. But strikingly, diabetes-related death is also is, is about four times what it is in the white community. And again, if you could tease out the African rates and the Southeast Asian rates, they'd look comparable. At the same time, this population comes with a burden of mental distress, and this is, uh, these are statistics from 2000 to 2004 in King County. And again, the rates among African Americans, 15% compared to 9% in their white counterparts. Uh, American Indians, uh, quite high, but if you could, again, tease out the rates of uh, the, the Southeast Asian immigrants and refugees, African immigrants and refugees, they'd be comparable, if not surpassing these. This is the burden of tuberculosis, 2005 and three quarters of the tuberculosis cases in King County were among the foreign born. Uh, Philippines leading the way, followed by Vietnam, Ethiopia, Mexico, and a smattering of other countries. So the authors of Unequal Treatment concluded that if you looked at populations with uh, equal access to health care, and you looked at the quality of health care, the difference between minority groups and non-minority groups can be really attributable to clinical need and patient preference the operation of healthcare systems and the legal and regulatory climate and discrimination, bias, um, prejudice, stereotyping, and uncertainty. And those latter two account for the disparity in healthcare that experienced between minority and non-minority communities. So again, they concluded that it's health systems level factors, financing, the structure of care, cultural and linguistic barriers, which I'm going to turn my attention to now. There are patient level factors. I've shown you some burden of disease, some biological factors, and preferences, and health beliefs, et cetera. Uh, but many of these things play themselves out in the clinical encounter. So let me just show you what this looks like so you get a sense of it. First, I'm going to show you just what most people think about when they think about interpreting encounter. It's a little vignette of a patient and I talking. But then I want to show you uh, a snippet of what it's like once the patient leaves the exam room and begins to take a paper to go find the CT scanner to get a needed CT that's semi-urgent. When you feel like that, do, do you feel yeah. funny? Yeah. When you have a picture like that? No, 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 yeah, I feel chilly, and then I talk So this some, is contained and uh, comfortable, you know, and there's this back and forth, working through an, a very good interpreter here, so you feel kind of sweaty making sense of my questions to her and her questions back to me. No. Okay, so you just feel, you feel cold. Feel cold. Yeah. But you take go a look straight. now. She's, she's got to you leave the, exit sign the clinic. Right there. You take a left and take the elevator, go up to one. Okay, that's where the radiology department's at. Yeah. Yet, yet no middle. What? Uh, yes, doctor is at Tony and work. Oh, do you have a paper? What a paper. Oh, okay. Let me see here. Oh, you need to go to radiology. So yeah. radiology is down the hall and to the left. Down the hall and to the left. Uh, down the hall and to the left. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. 
Okay. You're this doing is, this is x-ray. You go back. Back, uh, ba around, up. and up. So the point there is not only is she frustrated and lost and her workup goes unaddressed because she just leaves the hospital in frustration, and this is very typical, but the CT scanner goes unused, which was waiting for her, and then when she comes back to see her physician, that will be undone, and they'll start again, and so the resources are wasted. So how's Harborview met this, and this is, plays itself out and you'll see how many times at Harborview, and this is true across the country, at other institutions very similar to ours, County USC, Cook County, Bellevue, and uh, other institutions. So what Harborview has done over the course of the past 25 years or so has, to make, has the following, and I'm going to go into these in some detail, is to make non English speaking poor a component of the hospital mission, so starting within the, the integration of the hospital itself, to establish primary care homes for immigrants and refugees, which we'll talk about, and create ancillary services such as interpreter services that, uh, was, that were alluded to earlier. Uh, to support activity in the emergency department in the inpatient and outpatient services. And then it's supported the development of uh, cultural mediation with select communities, and I'll describe that for you, and a website to teach this locally and, and nationally. So here's our mission statement, and you can see that the non-English speaking poor are right there next to trauma and, and burn treatment. And it really helps at an administrative level. Those of you who do this work know that this helps guide policy and priorities. It, all right, the interpreter services that we have developed now employ 54 interpreters and four schedulers to uh, make sure that a really complicated dance between interpreters and physicians and uh, patients happens 100,000 times virtually a year, 73% of these in person, 27% by phone in 80, lang 80 plus languages. The top 10 are Spanish, Somali, Vietnamese, Amharic, Cambodian, Cantonese, Tigrinyan, Russian, Oromo, and Punjabi. In the ER, as I said, and throughout the radiology, rehab, ophthalmology, etc. Now, the primary care homes for patients are these, children's and teens clinic, women's clinic, adult medicine, Pioneer Square. Um, but also, we've done extensive work in oncology uh, with the psychiatric consultation service, end of life and palliative care, and interestingly enough, some interesting work with the medical examiner's office at the very, very end of life. So just to, but one of the, ho the homes for patients that we've established long ago was uh, the International Medicine Clinic. It's established in 1982. It began as an infectious disease effort and uh, started when it just saw Southeast Asian patients about a half a day a week. It's grown to 12 sessions a week, sees nearly 15,000 patients annually, and provides care for 35 of the largest and neediest linguistic groups in the, uh, the hospital sees. As much as possible, the, ho the clinic is staffed with people from the community so that they can greet the, the uh, patient population and, and explain uh, the c complexities of the hospital. But as you've seen, it, that's a challenging task because our patients come from these areas, uh, notably um, Central America and Mexico, South and Central Asia, Nepal especially, N Tibet and Afghanistan, uh, Eastern Europe, especially the former Soviet Union and uh, Ukraine and Bosnia, East Africa, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, and a growing number from West Africa, Congo, the Gambia, and Senegal, as well as I've mentioned, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Where we can, we train and recruit providers to provide care directly to their patients, as well as uh, nurses and other staff. But inevitably, it's impossible. You all, it, <laughs> you're going to end up seeing somebody who doesn't speak your language and providing care. And e that's true even if you're somebody who's been recruited to provide care to your community, you're going to end up seeing people in other communities. The scope of care in the clinic is primarily internal medicine, but because of the burden of depression, PTSD, and uh, other affective disorders, psychiatry plays a key role. Most importantly, pharmacy plays a role in what we do, providing uh, chronic disease management for asthma, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, we provide travel medicine services for our patients as they go home, because many of them go back to their countries of origin to take care of unfinished business or to bury loved ones. Um, nutritional support for reasons that will become evident, uh, as well as social work for the obvious social burden of illness that many of these patients have. Um, for about 
20 years, we've had a teaching relationship with Bastyr University and the Institute of Oriental Medicine, providing acupuncture and oriental medicine in clinic as well, and not just for Asian patients, for the spectrum of patients that we see. So there's an example of the pharmacy. The lead pharmacist is uh, Ethiopian, can speak directly to our patients uh, as he needs to. <coughs> When you think about cultural competence, although I'm not really sure I know what that is exactly, one of the best operational definitions that I've come across is from Risa Lavisa Mori uh, that uh, was written in the Annals several years ago. And she describes it as that cultural con competence is the demonstrated awareness and integration of three population-specific issues, health-related beliefs and cultural values, disease incidence and prevalence, and treatment <laughs> efficacy. But perhaps the most significant aspect of the concept, uh, concept is the inclusion and integration of these areas that are considered separately when they're considered at all. So it's geographic medicine, a familiarity with health beliefs and practices, and some knowledge of, of what's known about um, uh, treatment efficacy and the integration of those. This is particularly critical for chronic disease management, where many of the patients who come from areas of the world that are not familiar with biomedicine uh, ex have had very limited interaction with it and expect illness to be primarily symptomatic, very short-lived, if not acute most of the time, curable, uh, and the, or completely incurable, one of the two. The result of trauma infection, if it's spiritual affliction, they'll take that elsewhere for ritual intervention, but they turn to us if it, they think it's amenable to pharmaceutical or surgical treatment or they're dual users of both systems. So it requires to manage chronic disease requires an understanding both of the medical culture and the target culture to address concepts of chronic disease in, in the target culture, to find those metaphors within the target culture and knowing the conceptual associations of those metaphors in the target language. And that's where the interpreters help us considerably. Because considerably. often those metaphors come from the agricultural way of life or religious way of life. And that's what we use to, to do our education and to make sense of what we're trying to do. So let me give you an example of the kinds of, inter of misunderstandings that, that come up. And the, uh, tuberculosis is, is one that comes up occasionally. And so in the biomedical view, this is an infectious disease that's uh, caused by a bacteria. It has a long latent form. It's uh, got many symptoms. It can be renal. It can be uh, spinal. It can be pulmonary. It's completely preventable. And it's usually treatable. Now, in the Somali view, it's well known that it's infectious. That's, that's not a problem. They restrict the use of the words to weight loss and bloody cough. That's TB. Anything other is not TB. And this is because it, they, it's noticed that it often runs in families. And so the individual is isolated within the family if they've got tuberculosis. And the family is isolated within the community. And so what happens is that marriages will fail. Businesses will go under. And so it's often seen as a spiritual trial, like the trials of Job. And for that reason, even though it's treatable, it's feared, and it's often fatal at home at any, anyway. A different example comes from sleep paralysis. This is a psychiatric uh, symptom. In the biomedical view, sleep paralysis is, a, is the complete inability to move for one or two minutes immediately after awakening often accompanied by hypnagogic hallucination or a feeling of suffocation, and often associated with panic disorder or history of trauma. Now, the Cambodians know this symptom very well, and they call it kamak sangat, or the ghost pushes you down. It's considered to be attack by a dead person or a supernatural being, and it's common among survivors of the Khmer Rouge with PTSD and panic symptoms. So there, you bring up a symptom. People know immediately what you're talking about. They describe the symptom to you, and in your mind, you th you're thinking that perhaps a sleep study or uh, behavioral therapy and SSRI is appropriate, and they're thinking I might need to make a trip home to see a, a Khmer, a Kru Khmer to, to treat this, a traditional healer to treat it. So in addition to just the meaning and the complexity of illness and its symptoms, we also have to interpret, it, interpret the system. Formularies, um, one of the problems we have is similar symptoms are often treated by trading medications. And so Two neighbors will have a cough, one caused by congestive heart failure, the other one caused by asthma, and people will trade medications. And so you have to explain the differences in symptoms and diseases and treatment. The role of the clinic, how to use the clinic versus urgent care, the emergency department, and the complexities of resources, uh, resource allocation based on insurance type and severity of criteria. It's tedious, and at the same time, it's critical to get things done. So what we've done, because this all is supposed to happen, you've been to the doctor, what do we give you, like 15, 20 minutes? That's got to happen in that picture, in that segment of time. And so to do that, we've learned to manage a lot of the problems outside of the clinical setting. And we've done this with uh, one of the programs we call community house calls for some of the largest communities that we serve. And the goal of this was to create a common fund of knowledge between the medical and um, and uh, ethnic communities to decrease the language barriers by providing continuity in interpretation. 
and to change institutional practices that are particularly um, challenging to, to the communities that we serve and, and uh, affect them directly. To improve cross-cultural health care education for providers and trainees so that they get a sense for what's going on in the larger community and with their patient. And to uh, enhance efficient utilization of resources, as I just showed you earlier. So we provide these services in these large communities here in town. The Amharic community, Cambodian, Spanish, Somali, Tigrinian, Vietnamese. Currently we have 685 active cases with 378 referrals in 2007. So what do they do? They provide continuity interpretation from place to place. They might follow a patient to the hutch, over to the university, back to the hutch, and then back to Harborview. Um, they provide cultural mediation, explaining how language is used in those examples I gave you of tuberculosis and sleep paralysis between the different services. They coordinate aspects of care, especially for people who are sick, sick, and the last thing they're thinking about is how to make a phone call and how to get someplace they don't really want to go. Um, they promote continuity and fo uh, follow-up care, arrange for transportation, help with forms and applications, and do home visits to do chronic disease management. So here's an example of a class being taught by one of the navigators around um, diet and lipid management for uh, hyperlipidemia. For providers, these uh, navigators and case managers explain the biomedical practices in the country of origin. They talk about health beliefs. They teach the residents about, the pediatric residents about parenting practices or perinatal issues, or they talk to the intensive care unit about the delivering of bad news in the community and end of life issues around managing end of life. For the community, they create liaison between the, or, the leadership in the community and the and the uh, health center and help communities to network through an advisory board whose re mission is to strengthen the relationship between Harborview and the medical center. So here's an example of the advisory board doing its work uh, with representatives from all the communities collected together, in this case to work on some issues around oncology. A lot of this collective work is stored on a website we developed in, called Ethnomed. It gets about, um, oh, about 450,000 hits a year, I guess. And it, it's really a, an archive of the experience of that navigator program. So it's restricted to a certain number of communities. But it's intended to provide resources for clinicians about the community. So here's an example of a, of a Somali minority that, is, uh, that we, a provider could click in and get some background on the Somali Bantu refugees that are living in uh, the area. We recently received a, a large number of Karen refugees from the Burma border. Uh, we expect a large number of Bhutanese, uh, Nepalese living in Bhutan soon. So they could get background information on these communities. Uh, as well as traditional practices such as traditional Vietnamese medicine and how it's used in the community. But it also provides education for community members that can be delivered by the clinic. Here's an example of uh, a uh, Khmer publication on hepatitis B. Um, and also on the cancers that are a result of hepatitis B. Here's a tutorial that is, uh, I like a lot because you don't have to be literate. If you were illiterate in Vietnamese, you could, uh, it explains to you, it has audio, and you could learn to use the cursor and then go through a tutorial and learn about breast cancer and what to expect with a mammogram, et cetera. Here's information available for clinics on diabetes, for example, uh, a, a, a Vietnamese diet and how to manage that for diabetes or um, exercise in the Cambodian community, and emerging infections such as SARS and West Nile, et cetera. So there's information available there as well. It also provides clinical information such as the health disparities we saw for clinicians that aren't really accustomed to seeing it or treating it in these communities so they can get a little primer, a refresher, and a, a, some, some pearls on how to approach it. Um, and can make sense of practices. I mentioned traditional practices. Here's an example of coining in the Cambodian community and what it might look like on a child. And you th might think that this was abusive and in fact a very loving parent is taking good care of their kid. And it's important to know that so you don't misunderstand. Here's an example of cupping. So Harborview, in summary, Harborview's met the challenge through service. Uh, the primary care clinics I noted before, including international medicine, interpreter services, the community house calls navigation program. In teaching, uh, Ethnomed is an example, resident training that we do, the community education that we do in partnership with the residents, and in research, which we haven't had a chance to talk about tonight. But I just want to comment on a couple of shared features of global medicine as it's conceptualized abroad and here in Seattle. We share populations with a disproportionate burden of illness that have linguistic barriers between biomedicine that is the medical, the technical medic, med, uh, language of medicine, and the vernacular. 
and a need for an interface between medical technologies and local culture and customs. And, not, and most important, I think, workforce development adapted to local settings, such as the navigators and interpreters and other, other workforce elements that we, and tr providers that we seek to recruit. But there's some real differences. In the United States, I mentioned chronic disease. Most of what we do is to integrate immigrants into, the American, uh, into American medicine. Um, the acute conditions are quickly resolved, leaving us with chronic conditions, whether it's HIV or diabetes, hypertension, depression, or very often all of those things, uh, which requires extensive education. In the home country, the primary care system is often very fragmented, if it's existent at all, and primarily urban. It's uh, acute and infectious processes are the focus of activity. Chronic disease management is often unaffordable by most of the population and unfamiliar for that reason. Um, specialty care, as you're going to see, is very difficult to access. And most of the focus is on public health education and prevent where prevention is a priority. So there's very sort of different priorities in different places. And I think it presents unique challenges in both places. Thank you for your attention tonight. I'm going to hand it off to you. And it's a, a real privilege for me to introduce Phil Borges, who is a really world-renowned photographer who we're so fortunate to have as also a member of our community. I should say, actually, this is a, 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 it's Dr. Borges. Phil Borges is actually a retired orthodontist who, during his stint in the United States Air, States Air Force in his travels around the world became fascinated with photographing people of indigenous cultures. And he's now world renowned for his efforts. His award winning books are published in four languages. He's been honored with many numerous awards, including Photo Media Magazine's Photo Person of the Year, but even most importantly, in the business of photography, instead of Oscars, there are what are known as Lucy's. And Phil has been awarded the Humanitarian Lucy Award by the Society of International Photographers. He's also received a Medal of Honor from the University of California, San Francisco, and also the Purpose Prize by the Civic Ventures Award at Stanford University. I got to know Phil because my dear friend and neighbor, Susan Hirasawa, is and served as his executive director for a phenomenal effort. And we've heard about our, the care of our local immigrant population in Seattle. Phil and his group at Bridgers to Understanding have developed an international middle school educational and digital storytelling exchange that brings together children of middle school age through the wonders of digital storytelling linked through the internet in places as far flung as Cape Town, South Africa, Arctic Village in Alaska, the Navajo Village in the Southwest, in New Mexico and Arizona, and many other locations around the world. Truly a remarkable effort that links our own Seattle school system headquartered at Aki Kurosi in South uh, Seattle. So he's lectured extensively on international uh, cultures, anthropology. He recently published his most uh, recent book and was awarded uh, high honors at the United Nations. So sit back, enjoy the wonderful work and the beautiful contribution of Dr. and Mr. Phil Borges. Phil. Thank you, Hugh. I wanted to talk about my latest book, um, which concerns the empowerment of women in the developing world. And I, um, through my work over the last 25 years, it became hard to ignore how much women and girls were discriminated against in the developing world. And if you look at UN statistics, it's quite startling. Um, women grow 50% of the food in the world. They own 1% of the farmland. So access to resources is very minimal for women. In terms of education, of the nearly 1 billion illiterate adults in the world, 
two-thirds are women. Uh, in terms of having a voice in the community, only 10% of the world's legislators are women. So um, I wanted to make a statement about this, and I decided to put this book together and tell us a, a, a series of hero stories about women who are breaking through the glass ceiling in their respective cultures. So I thought I'd tell a couple of stories tonight that have something to do with um, health. And so the first woman I want to talk about is a woman by the name of Akai. She's 32 years old. And Akai was sold into a brothel when she was 12 years old in Bangladesh. And this happens quite a bit in this country. Women, young girls, are told that they're going to a garment factory to get a job. They leave their homes. They go to the capital, Dhaka. Next thing they know, they're in a brothel. And uh, Bangladesh is 100% Muslim. And, excuse me, it's about 90% Muslim, 10% Hindu. And prostitution, being a sex worker, is so stigmatized that once these girls go into the brothel, there's no way they can get out. There's no way for them to leave and get a job later. So in the brothel that she is in, a little town called Tangail, which is north of Dhaka in Bangladesh, there are 700 sex workers, but in addition to the 700 sex workers, there are, are their families um, and older sex workers. In other words, this is kind of a forbidden city that just grows because nobody leaves it. Now, the women in the brothel have almost no rights. They, um, if they have kids, their kids can't go to school. They can't save money in a bank. They can't have a bank account. When they die, they can't be buried. They're thrown in the river, and that's a very big disgrace for a Muslim person. They can't wear the three-piece sari, which is um, standard fare for them. And this little community has its own grocery stores. This is the beauty parlor in the brothel. Um, all the kids live in the brothel. They're not allowed to go to school. The older sex workers, typically a woman is considered undesirable after the age of 35, and she becomes a servant to the other sex workers. So the older sex workers are living in the brothel. Um, Akai, when she turned 18, tried to commit suicide. The conditions she was living in were so bad. And it failed. And when she came out of that, she told us that she had a revelation. And she decided she wanted to do something about the conditions in the brothel. So when I was there um, doing the story on her, um, I interviewed several of the people that were working with her. And this is a Klima. And a Klima is 23 years old. And and she went into the brothel when she was 12 years old, same story. And while I was interviewing her, somebody came in and said something in Bengali to her. And immediately, everybody in the room jumped up, started screaming, started hugging each other, kissing each other, celebrating. I said, what did they say? And she said, for the very first time, a policeman was arrested for beating up a sex worker and typically, why these workers got beat up is because they demanded that the man wear a condom. And so what Akai did was gather the women together, and she had a little help from the organization CARE. And they gave her a little bit of advocacy um, help, uh, support, just letting her know what her rights were. And she organized the women, and she managed over a two-year period to get the condom rate from 0% all the way up to 85%. And um, this is Chandi. And Chandi is what they call an indentured sex worker. She's owned by an older sex worker. She will have to work her way out of bondage. This is Jacina. Jacina is, I think, she was 11 years old when I took this picture. 
She is the daughter of a sex worker. She will undoubtedly, because she can't go to school, she can't get out of the brothel, she will become a sex worker in a couple of years. This is the um, little school that Akai started. And this was their lunch period. And these are the kids of the sex workers. This is Akai. Some of the kids in the brothel that now are going to school but cannot leave the brothel. So, you know, we have a provision that was just the PEPFAR um, grant that um, President Bush allowed 15 billion dollars to be allowed for um, AIDS help around the world. And on that bill, there was a provision that a third of it had to go for abstinence before marriage. Um, it was the abstinence before marriage provision. And this program that was supporting Akai and her outreach workers, she had 25 outreach workers, dried up the month I was there doing the story because of that provision. So I went back to Washington with some of the care staff and we lobbied to get that provision off the bill. It was taken off the bill, but in a way that President Bush still can put it on, it, it gave the president discretion whether it would be, um, viable or not. So this, in fact, tomorrow they're re-voting on this whole thing to, um, that PEPFAR co um, covered five years. For the next five years, they're talking about redoing it and upping the amount that goes for AIDS and um, they're hoping to remove that provision altogether. Um, unless women are empowered to say no to sex, to say a man has to use a condom, we're not gonna stop the spread of AIDS. Um, AIDS is becoming a women's disease. I think you know that in Sub-Saharan Africa right now, three out of the four new cases of AIDS are women. So it's a very important thing in the fight against that disease that we do empower women. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, the next person I want to talk about is a very brave woman by the name of Abai, 28 years old. And I met Abai, she lives in Ethiopia, up near the Somali border, in one of the most um, arid parts of Ethiopia. When you saw the starving children in Ethiopia in the 80s, you were looking at the people in this area. They're called the Afar. There's 1.3 million Afar people. They live mainly off their camels and their cattle. Right now, because of global warming, it's, the drought is very heavy up there, and the, the um, cattle have m almost all died out. Um, the children, there's only 2% literacy in the Afar territory. And the Afar women build the houses, they take care of the kids. They take care of the animals. They bring in the water, which is a major deal. It takes hours to go and collect the water. They bring in the firewood. Yet they are not allowed to attend the all-male meetings that pass the laws that govern their lives. And this is a common thing I see in many parts of the world where women have a very limited voice in their local government. The other thing about the Afar is the Afar practiced the most severe form of female genital cutting. Um, the, the girls are ceremonially cut at age 12. They never get beyond age 12. All girls go through this in groups of 20. The women do all the cutting. The men never see it. And it, it results in almost 10% mortality, just the, the procedure itself, and 
all sorts of complications in childbirth. And um, so it's a very, very harmful practice. They literally bind the girl's legs together for 30 days and the vagina almost seals shut except for an opening of about an eighth of an inch. The women carry a feather in their hair to open themselves up when they urinate. And it's, it, it's, it's a practice that's gone on for centuries. So a bai, to get back to her story, a bai, when she turned eight years old, her mother said it was time for her ceremony. And she said no. And this was just unheard of for anybody to even um, resist the ceremony. But she had a godfather who was, who was educated and was kind of advising her. And her mother said, no, there's absolutely no way. You've got to be circumcised. Uh, an uncircumcised woman would never be married. She'll be an outcast in the community. And so Abai ended up running away from home and living with this godfather. And so she went to Addis Ababa, got an education, went through high school, and when she graduated, she decided she wanted to go back into her village and do something about it. So she got, an, uh, she got a job with the organization CARE. She went back into her village, and over a five-year period, she put in a well, she put in a couple of health posts, she put in a couple of schools, things these people had never had before. She also got them started on an agricultural program. They never were, they were all pastoralists. They didn't know how to grow um, food, so she got them started on that. And the whole time she was doing this, she got the confidence of the woman up to the point where she could start discussing female genital cutting. So she was just asking them, what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And, and when the men heard about this, that she was talking about this sacred ceremony, they just got irate. And one man threatened her with a gun, another man kicked her to the ground. And she realized at that point, if she was going to make any change, she was going to have to bring men into the equation somehow. So she did something that was just, I consider, very ingenious. She took got a hold of a little camcorder and recorded, a, allowed, a, asked the women if she could record one of the circumcision ceremonies. And this little grainy film, I've cut out all the graphic parts, but it was very, very hard to watch. And she took this film and she brought it to the men and, and, and had them hold a meeting and she showed them what a cutting ceremony was and what it looked like. And the men were so horrified when they saw this, they called another meeting and all got together, 17 of the men leaders. They voted 15 to 2 to put an end to female genital cutting in their, in their community. And this was after this practice had gone on for centuries. It had, they had put up with this, this the, De debilitating health aspects of this for, they say, 4,000 years from the time of the pharaohs. And so here's one of the, the male leaders. His name is Haji Waldo. He's 70 years old. And when we interviewed him, he said, you know, once I saw that film, there was no way I was going to let my granddaughters go through this ceremony. This is Ask Jelly. She's 52 years old. She started doing circumcisions when she was 14 years old. Her grandmother taught her. And she just said, when we interviewed her, you know, we did this because that's what had always been done. That's just all we knew. And um, it just really struck me when she said that, that, you know, I just thought back to my own culture. What are the things we're doing? Because they've just always been done, whether they make sense or not. This is Sanim, 21 years old. He's a young warrior in the Afar tribe. We asked him what he thought about the changes. He said, you know, I think I could marry an uncircumcised girl. 
it seems strange, but I think I could do it. So he, we, we were literally just watching that transition of a culture giving up a very sacred rite of passage. This is Saida, 48 years old. She was elected to be the leader of the anti-female genital, genital cutting association. And that association's job was to go around, they, these women all got together in this community and said, we're gonna go around to the other communities. The community of Arash Fintali, where they passed this law, is 5,000 people. There's 1.3 million Afar people. So they have a huge job to do to try and get this, um, this practice stopped in the rest of the Afar community. Tens of thousands of girls go through this every year. This is Hawa. She's eight years old. She will be the first girl in her family going back, um, in her family history going back forever that will not be circumcised because of what Abai did. And I just thought, you know, what, how, you know, how simple that was to end that. Just short circuit that impasse of communication between men and women in this, in this culture, in this tribe. And all it took was this cheap little camcorder and a little laptop that she took and presented this to the, the leaders. So there was this bridge, you know, the men made all the decisions, the women did all the circumcision, they didn't talk about it. It was a taboo to share it, and how that changed with that one little act. Um, the last person I want to talk about, I just got back from Sri Lanka where I was doing a story for an organization called Interplast that treats burn patients um, around the world. And they, the way they work is they empower local uh, doctors to do their work. And this is Chandini. She is the plastic surgeon, or the only female plastic surgeon in Sri Lanka, a country of 20 million people. And she took over the burn unit. And the burn unit, as she has ex explained it, was kind of the stepchild of, of medicine. Nobody wants to deal with burns. They're hard to deal with. It takes a long time to heal. Um, you can't get a very good result if you're a plastic surgeon. Um, you want better results than what you can get. And she really resisted going into this whole field because of the way burns were treated in Sri Lanka. Um, many of the burns occurred were like 40 to 50 percent burns, 30 percent burns, and on the front of the body, up the neck, and a burn, when it heals, contracts. The scar tissue contracts. And many of the patients that would come to her after being in the provinces and not being treated properly, their chins would go right down to their chests, their arms would contract up, and they would present in this almost fetal position without being able to move, and she would have to relieve those contractions. But the interesting thing to me about these burns is they were classified as accidental burns. And until Chandini started really delving into how these accidents occurred, she found out that these were mostly self-immolation burns. These women were setting themselves on fire. And this is a Buddhist culture, 85% Buddhist. And uh, trying to commit suicide is such a stigmatized event that no one would admit to, uh, to um, the fact that they tried to commit suicide. And these women, and she gets, like, in January, she got 80 patients. And 70% of them were self-immolation. 5% were acid burns, homicidal acid burns, and the rest were accidental burns. And before this time, this is a typical woman who is self-immolated. Um, the common reason is domestic violence. Um, either physical or emotional abuse. Again, 
the power of women, the disempowered women that can't do anything about it. In their Buddhist culture, tolerance is the big issue. So they hold it in and then one day they finally explode and the common thing to do for one reason or another in South Asia and in Bangladesh um, is to set themselves on fire. They douse themselves with kerosene and light it. Um, her job, what she did with this clinic, she brought in a psychologist. And that's when they started discovering that these accidental burns were really not accidental. And so there was really, and you would think about it, they were treating the symptoms, the burn. But below that, there's this whole cultural issue that had to be dealt with. And, and it had to do with the empowerment of women. You know, the other statistic about women um, that was really fascinating to me in the UN statistics is if you give a woman a hundred dollars, 90 of those dollars go into her family and in, in the developing world. The same amount given to a man in the developing world, only 30 to 40 dollars goes into the family. So, and that goes into the community and builds a community. So, this is why microcredit is, works through women. All these development agencies have found that the quickest way to get a community out of poverty is to empower the women. And um, I became a big fan of the organization CARE because the way they do it is so economical. They'll empower one or two women. And many of the women I put in the book were women they worked with. And those women become role models for the rest of the community. And it isn't long before five women do the same thing that that one woman did. And it's almost like a chain reaction. It can transform the community within 10 or 15 years. So um, I became a big fan of care. And I think I'll end it there. Thank you.